नमस्कार वेलकम टू दिस लेक्चर ऑन मल्टीटास्किंग व्हिच इज़ वन ऑफ द लेक्चर्स इन द सीरीज ऑन इंजीनियरिंग साइकोलॉजी अप टिल नाउ वी हैव लुक्ड एट द डेफिनेशन एंड रिसर्च मेथड्स वी आल्सो लुक्ड एट टू सेंसरी कैपेबिलिटीज इन डिटेल द वन कंसर्न विद विजन एंड द अदर कंसर्न विद ऑडिटरी and we also looked at methods of evaluating design modifications the next series of lecture will be focused on cognitive capabilities of humans although the auditory and visual system provide sensory stimulus for cognition to work but an understanding of the cognitive capability is most essential and basic to understanding engineering psychology in present lecture and the one which follows we'll look at the cognitive capability of the human information processing system and in the next set of lectures we we'll look at an important higher order con- cognitive functioning which is called decision making so let's start today's lecture the focus of today's lecture is multitasking now if you look around you most of the times you are multitasking what does multitasking actually employ i'll try and explain this through some scenarios think about a locomotive driver now his job is simple he has to take the train from point a to point b the essential features of this job requires transportation with safety and on time seems very easy all you have to do is start the engine and for locomotives you don't even have competing locomotives so it's easy to drive now if it is such an easy job why do we see a lot of accidents let's focus in some more detail the job of a locomotive driver driving is a bigger job other than that he has to do multi functions at the same point of time not only he has to start the engine and monitor the engine he also has to keep an eye on what are the different system parameters if it's a diesel engine he should have some idea as to how much diesel is remaining and how much has he used up and also how much diesel would be required to navigate from point a to b beside that he has to also look at certain controls and warnings which the integrated system provides from time to time this is the scenario within the locomotive cabin but outside the locomotive cabin he has also to look out for signals from the various stations that he passes various signals that he passes and if that was not enough he also has to take care and see whether there are some obstructions on the railway line which is driving all of this requires the driver to do multitask for a moment think about a running train the driver is looking through the viewing window seeing sign posts go by reading the sign posts making meaning of it accelerating or decelerating the locomotive according to situations and also keep his own health and well being intact so a number of jobs at the same point of time on the other hand there are situations in which little multitasking is required think about a person who put stamps on letters in a post office his job is simple all he has to do is put stamps on letters which are coming from the mail so lesser multitasking but he does has one or two checkpoints to look at as in verify the letter has an address where it needs to be delivered and if it the letter is intact and after viewing these jobs and information he can put on the stamp so then people multitask at various levels and one of the main understanding 
that an engineering psychologist has to understand is that any job which requires a human system interaction has an essential part added to it which is linked to processing a number of information at the same time and getting task accomplished. So, multitasking is an essential feature. What we are going to do is understand what are the different types of multitasking and the process of multitasking itself. We will also look at those cognitive systems which help us in multitasking. So, the question is, is multitasking easy or difficult and what can we do to make some jobs easier to multitask than other jobs. To re-specify, are there factors which suggest whether a job can be done with the least cognitive resources and are there other jobs which require a lot of cognitive resources. So, let us begin understanding what is multitasking. As I discussed before, people multitask most of the time and they are very good at it. Take the example of driving. When you are driving a car, you are not only playing out with the controls of the car, but also through the wind screen looking at traffic and pedestrians crossing the road. In the same point of time, you are also monitoring different road signs which help you in navigating and with that you are also involved in some sort of conversation with the passenger who is sitting right next to you. In addition, you are also looking through your rear view mirrors to see the traffic behind you and listening to music or radio. So, a number of jobs that you are doing, but how do you accomplish all this and what can be done to improve multitasking? So, let us try and understand that. Now, despite our success at multitasking, it is very apparent that we are more successful at juggling some tasks than others. This is the question that I put to you a moment before. Are there certain jobs which are easy to multitask and are there jobs which are difficult to multitask? And the answer to this is yes, well practiced tasks are easy to multitask whereas, novel tasks or complex tasks are difficult to multitask. This is just a simple answer. What I will do is I will elaborate these answers so that you understand what is the meaning of an easy task and what does it mean to do a complex task. So, the ability to multitask depends upon whether we are just learning the task or if we are more experienced or expert at a task. If you are a new driver, you will be concerned about the controls, you will be concerned about the steering, you will be concerned about the fact that your car does not hit someone or you are not hit by some other car and so a lot of information to process. You have seen all those new drivers who are learning how stressed and attentive they are. And if the person who is teaching them is sitting right beside them and giving them some instructions or comments, there is a high probability that they will ignore these comments or it will not get registered. Now, driving for new drivers is a difficult task and they have very less experience in practice with it. So, they cannot divert their attention anywhere else and so in this case multitasking is difficult. Let us move ahead one year and assume that the driver has not given up and still driving. Now, he has become more experienced and so when this new driver 
after one year when he drives a car it becomes very easy for him to drive because now he knows these controls on the fingertips he has learned a lot of knowledge about the road and gained experiences and these experiences help in navigating and so now he can safely use his attention somewhere else like talking to a passenger or listening to music so the more experience you get the more practice you do the more easier it becomes for you to multitask and the example that i have put here is in terms of typing when you are typing in silence it is easier and much faster but if there is an audience who is talking to you while you are typing you are doing many jobs at the same point of time and so it becomes difficult and multitasking in cases where an audience is present becomes difficult so to understand multitasking and to understand why we are not able to multitask or we are able to multitask let's look at how is information processed by the human system so how cognitive system processes information if you are able to understand the steps and process through which information from the sensory organs are processed and meaning extracted out of it we will be able to find those factors which can help us in multitasking multitasking as i have said before is important because most of the time when you are working with a system the system gives you multiple information the job of the operator is to understand all these informations integrate them together and provide a feedback to the system in terms of what should be the next step for the system so let's understand how information is processed by the human system now one of the major reasons for more research to focus on multitasking in engineering psychology started with a concern and the concern was when people use cell phone while driving they were committing a lot of accidents if you turn your driving license even in that it is written that don't use a cell phone while driving so what is so difficult from understanding of cognition talking is one modality and driving is another modality whereas talking requires you to use auditory and visual inputs driving primarily is focused on motor inputs and so if they are using different channels why is it difficult to talk on a cell phone and drive to understand that we have to understand how information is processed now one solution to not using hand hold cell phone was to give a hands free cell phone system in the car you have this bluetooth which is connected to your cell phone and this bluetooth transfers your call on to your steering and you can take up a call hands free thus freeing the motor modality but still it has been found that these hands free cell phone arrangement is causing as much accidents as the handheld phone 
So, what is the reason? And that lies in understanding how information is processed. So, understanding the conditions and task properties that facilitate effective multitasking is the goal of human factors. We have to understand what conditions and what task properties modulate multitasking. And once we are clear with that, we will able to manage multitasking at a high efficiency level. So, how is information transferred from the sensory organ to the cognitive processors in your head which make meaning of this information and provides you alternate which you can choose and take an action in terms of your driving scene you are driving and suddenly a child walks in front of your car. Your immediate reaction would be to press the brakes. Now, if you are at slow speed the car will stop, but at very high speed the chances are that the car would topple over. So, you have to do some other driving maneuver to escape this situation, but this simple job of seeing the child to this driving maneuver that you are doing to avoid the accident has many stages with it. It starts with information being received at your sensory receptors which is the first stage of contact between the external world and you. Then passing of this information to other systems and we will look at these systems in one moment. So, the model of information processing emphasizes the flow of information from sensory processes through hypothesized cognitive processes. What does it mean? Typically, the information processing in humans takes place through a multi step system. So, we start with information which is coming from the environment. This could be the sound, it could be the light which is being refracted from certain surfaces or it could be the pressure sensation that your skin is feeling. So, all these either the sound, light or pressure from the environment hits up against the sensory organ. This is the first line of impact. of the external world and you. Let us take the example of a eye. 
So, light which is reflected from let us say a tree here on the external environment, it gets reflected and it sen gets sent to your eye. The eye is the sensory organ. Now, on the eye, a lot of information will fall. This information will be in terms of the color of the object, it could be in terms of the form or the physical property of the object, it could be in terms of the orientation of the object and so on and so forth. So, this information which is falling on the sensory receptor I gets transferred to a buffer system which is called the sensory register. This sensory register is a buffer, the input side of the sensory register. So, it has two sides the input and output. The input side of a sensory register takes in huge amounts of information, but the output side of the sensory register passes on, passes on limited information. So, again redrawing it the whole thing. So, on this side you have the environmental stimuli, they get transferred to the sensory register We look at the properties of all these systems in a moment and the sensory register transfer this information into something called the working memory store. Earlier this working memory store was called the short term store. But due to some improvements of the nature of short term store and some controversies on the nature of the short term store, it has been redefined as the working memory store. So, information which is coming from the environment comes to the sensory register. The sensory register uses a process called attention. Attention is like a filter, the same filter that you see when we use the sieve, the netted object to make tea. So, this attention decides what information will go to the working memory store. The working memory store sends this information into the long term store and this sensory memory store and long term store are in complete synchrony with each other. The information processing goes about this way. So, information from the environment reaches the sensory register. This sensory register uses attention to move forward information. The information goes to the working memory. The working memory sends it to long term memory. From there a decision making happens as in what should be the response and then there, there is a step which is called response execution. So, in decision making it is called response selection. So, information from the sensor register through attention reaches working memory, working memory sends this information to long term memory where processing happens and from long term memory with the use of a lot of process a decision has to be made 
as to what should be the response to a particular situation. Once the response is selected, a response has to be executed and this is called the response execution stage. These are all combined together called the information processing in cognitive systems. Now, this structure which uses sensory register, attention, working memory and through rehearsal, this information getting transferred to long term memory is called the modal model of memory. This is the part of this whole information transfer paradigm or information transfer system. So, as we looked at how information from the environment passes through several hypothesis system which are cognitive in nature and that leads to the execution. Let us discuss these stores one by one. The first store as we discussed is called the attention store. Attention is the filter which decides what information coming from the environment should be processed. So, a child runs in front of you. Although your eyes can see a lot of information, this child running in front of you takes priority and attention is focused onto him and this information gets passed on to your higher cognitive processes. Short term memory which now is called working memory, this will store this information that an event has happened and if this event is important it will be mentally rehearsed, if it is not then it will be deleted. So, the child passed very quickly or it was not a child to start with it was a polythene bag. That kind of information needs to be verified by the long term memory and so this information that something is passed gets stored for very short duration in short term memory. Now, if it passed so fast that before your response execution nothing has happened, then information will be deleted from short term memory. But assuming that you get confirmed that it is a child, this information gets passed to th something called the long term memory and the long term memory then decides what is it that you are seeing, what situation, has this situation happened before, what are the necessary steps that you can take. So, it will use your experience and it is also use the information which is coming from the sensory system combine them up to give you possible solutions. One possible solution could be applying hard brake which can stop the car, but an alternative is the car would topple over and the other possible solution is to maneuver the car in such a way that the child passes. This two alternatives are provided by the long term memory. The decision making system now looks at the pros and cons of each alternative which has been provided to you and by calculating all the odds it does a response execution. So, if it is a paper bag which is moving in front of you and not a child you will go on without stopping or hitting the brake, but if it is a child and if he is still not come in between you and the car, he is still at the periphery of the car, you will do a loud honk. So, that by listening the horn he will go back, but assuming that if he has come to the middle of the car, then either you will brake or you will maneuver the car somewhere else. This act of either honking or maneuvering the car or applying brake is called response execution. So, right from the time when you are weighing the child to the time that you execute a response, these hypothetical systems come into play. Now, model of information processing are computers metaphor with distinct stages for input processing and output. As I explained you in the drawing, the input was the sensory register, 
the processing was the working memory and the long term memory and the output was the motor execution, the act of maneuvering the car or applying the brake through the motor system. So, there are different states to it. Now, the property of each state including its capacity and codes for representing information are derived from research. In the field of experimental psychology, neuroscience, computer science and physiology, each stage from input to processing to output has their own limitations as well as capabilities. They have distinct features and they have distinct properties. The properties of each of this stage have been experimentally verified and tested using various kind of tests and a knowledge of these properties will help system designers in creating systems which help users rather than which taxes users with so much information that an accident becomes evident. So, we will look at different stages and I also try to explain the different codes, the different limits and the different properties of each stage. The three gender stages of information processing is encoding, central processing and responding. Encoding is the act of taking in information from the environment and processing it with the help of attention. Central processing is that system which with the help of working memory and long term memory processes information so that you get alternatives what to do in a certain situation and responding is that part of the information processing architecture where either a motor response or a verbal response is given. What is encoding? Encoding is the registration of stimulus on the sensory receptors and the further processing of this using attention. So, encoding comprises of taking information and processing it to the next stage. This is the first point of entry between the human receptor and the external world. Central processing is the processing of stimulus by the operator. This is the stage where the information has hit the receptor. From that point onwards to just before some response is given by the human either in terms of a hand movement or in terms of verbal or in terms of some visual action, anything in between that con consists of the central processing. Responding involves response generation and its execution by the operator either through the verbal or motor mechanisms. So, in our the case of the car, encoding is that step where you see the child coming in front of your car and with that a lot of other information is also being hit at your eye. So, you use your attention because the child running is more important and so with the help of attention you process this information. This information through the eye reaches the brain where higher cognitive processes make all type of calculations and decide what is the move that you want to do. This is called central processing and the move that you do is called the responding. Now, as I explained to you the information processing architecture in humans comprises of a sensory register, a working memory component and a long term memory which is further related to response selection and response execution. This sensory register what is it and why do we need it? Let us try and understand that. So, the environment around us 
bombard our senses continuously with sensory stimuli. There are five different sensory register that we have. The most studied are the visual and auditory. So, we will be concerning with the visual and auditory sensory register and these sensory registers are responsible for taking in all the information which is available from the environment. Imagine you are in your lecture sitting, now you are hearing your professor's voice who is giving the lecture, but beside that there is a lot of other sounds which are also hitting your ear. It is the fan or your friend talking or the moving of pen against paper or the movement of shirt against your body or some other noise. Now, depending on what is important to you, you try to put your attention on that particular stimuli. So, once you are engrossed in this lecture, once you are listening to the lecture very attentively, all other sounds disappear. The disappearance of other sound makes you possible to concentrate on the professor's voice and listen to the lecture. But this does not mean that other sounds do not exist. Other sounds are still hitting your ear, but the ear is using the mechanism of attention to focus on to your lecturer's voice. This system which takes up all the sound, but only allows your professor's voice to move forward is called the sensory register. Now, each sensory register has its own property, let us try and understand that. So, experimental evidence suggests that representations of the sensory stimuli are captured by the sensory register in raw form, but visual and auditory systems. Experiments were done to prove that what is the nature of stimulus which hits the sensory register and it has been found that it is in the raw form. The information which is coming from the environment and which is hitting the input part of your register are available to you, but for a very brief period of time. If you do not process it, it will die down and there are experiments which are done to prove just this that all information is available. We will see those experiments in a moment. Now, an impression of the visual scene is briefly retained by the sensory register. This rules out the overwriting of consequent impression. The fact that the sensory register holds all information temporarily makes sure that things are not overexposed that the same stimuli is not coming a multiple number of times. It prevents the overwriting of initial expression. So, let us see two type of sensory registers. As I explained to you, there are five different senses. Now, at the level of sensory register, the information that is contained would be different. The visual information is in the form of light whereas the auditory information is in the form of sound. So, let us understand what these different forms of sensory register are. Now, the visual register is called the icon. The visual representations are stored as icons and can be best studied using Sperling's partial report technique. To give you an understanding of what the visual register or icons are like, when you are in a class and the professor just before the class tests his slides by quickly projecting the slide first and then taking it off to see whether everything is working or not. Now, if you were looking at the gazing area, you will see a quick image of the slide which very quickly fades away. This feeling and this process 
of the stimuli being present and disappearing very fast is the icon. Since it is the visual medium, it is called the visual icon. Now, these representations, the icons, the test of this that it is available that all of information which is hitting the eye is available for a very small period of time can be done through a experiment which is called Sperling's partial report technique. Now, the study provides details about capacity and duration of nature of visual icons. What is the study look like? In this study, people view a 3 by 4 matrix. So, you have 4 rows and 3 columns and you have letters written on them A, B, K, T, P this kind of a thing and this is presented to you very quickly for 50 millisecond. The job of the viewer is to write back or reproduce what letters are presented here. So, people viewed a 3 by 4 matrix of letters for brief time 50 millisecond and were asked to reproduce the matrix with accuracy. People could respond 3 to 4 letters at best, but reported seeing a rapidly degrading image of the matrix. This rapidly degrading image of the matrix is for what is called the icons. Now, the fact that people are reporting that they are seeing this degrading matrix is proof enough to suggest that all information is available for very brief period of time. But to test whether all information is available, Sperling did a modification. He presented cues and these cues were tones that alerted subjects which road to reproduce. A much higher accuracy of letter responding could be achieved. So, what he did was he presented a tone which is attached to each of this row. Initially, in the whole report, subjects were given this presentation for 50 millisecond and they were supposed to write all of these letters and they could complete only 3 or 4 letters. But later on this was presented matrix and 3 tones were associated to one of the row, the higher tone for the first row, a low tone for the second row and a medi medium tone for the third row. And just before this matrix was presented, the tone was presented. So, let us say I have a high tone. Now, subjects were only required to reproduce the first line of this matrix or if I present the middle tone, subjects were required to reproduce the last row of the matrix. Spelling found that it is very easy to reproduce the line associated with the tone. You only have to reproduce 4 letters and this proved that information is not only available but it is degrading very fast. If something can be done to preferentially select some information from the whole amount of information which is available in your sensor register, this information can be preferentially processed. Now, with the design modification, participants could reliably report any row of letters thus confirming their report that all letters are available, but for a very brief period of time. Now, the temporary nature of the iconic register and the difficulty observers may have maintained in complex visual images for reference when conditions allow only brief glance of the visual display. This is similar to what happens when you want to see a complex display or a complex scene. When you are seeing a complex scene, a lot of elements are present, but a quick glance on it will not help you in evaluating everything. By using attention, you can specifically see some parts of this image, but other parts would disappear. Now, the question is, is there an auditory equivalent of the icon? And the answer to that is the echo. What is echo like? When you see a movie and a large sound is produced, even if the sound disappears, there is a ringing in the ear. 
this ringing in the ear is the echo. So, echoes are icon analog in auditory system and they are short lived, but their repetitive nature allows subjects additional time for responding. In auditory system, we have seen before that auditory warnings are transitory in nature. Although they are available for longer period of time, but the information that they convey is limited. So, although short lived by the nature that it is vibrating in your ears, you get the time for responding. Now, since echoes are sub vocally rehearsed, they can hold on to auditory information longer than the icons, which is 250 millisecond, thus allowing users to defer their responses. Echoes are vibrations which are continuously repeated and so they stay for longer duration of time, which makes users defer their immediate response. Echoes stay for longer duration, so people can take some more time in responding. One advantage of an echo is the omnidirectionality and large duration than icon. So, echoes can come from anywhere, auditory systems have this property that a signal can come from any direction and it has a larger duration, it stays for longer period of time. One disadvantage is its transitory nature demands immediate attention. Echoes are transitory, they do not stay for too long and so you have to immediately put attention onto them. So, these are about the icons and the echoes which are the basic information blocks. The next step in the information processing architecture is called the short term memory. The short term memory is like a store which holds on to information for very brief time. If this information is not rehearsed, it will get lost. But if it is rehearsed, it stays for longer duration time and if this information is associated with a meaning, this information gets pushed onto long term memory and stays there for maybe a lifetime. So, let us look at what is short term memory. Items from the sensory register if rehearsed can temporarily be stored in short TM. If we do not rehearse it, it will get lost within 20 seconds. So, the duration of short term memory is 20 seconds. STM has limited capacity, but longer duration of information availability. So, although a number of information cannot be stored in STM, limited information can be stored in STM, but it is longer than the sensor register, it is for 20 seconds. As I explained before, if we rehearse this information, this information gets stored for longer duration, sometimes over lifetime. Now, the biggest information enemy in the short term memory is interference from tasks similar to the one being held in STM. Let us assume that you are holding on a number, somebody gave you a mobile number and you are constantly repeating this mobile number because you have do not have a notepad to write it down and some other number is spoken to you. When both the numbers come to you, both will interfere with each other and it will make a mess as in you will not be able to remember the first number. Remember that coding or storage of information in short term memory is in vocal terms, it is in terms of auditory nature. And so, if two objects have similar auditory response they will interfere with each other. Two letters like B and P, since they are similar in sounding, their phonology is more or less similar, they are similar sounding words, they are often con confused. The reason behind this is that this store of short term memory is holding information in verbal format. To prove how long an information can store in short term memory, Brown and Peterson did an excellent task. What they did was they presented subjects with three letter words like A, B, C or P, Q, T and they asked people to hold on these two to these words. 
then they ask people to count from 1000 backward 3. So, 1000, then 997, then 994 and then 991 this way. So, keep on counting backwards and hold this CVC like A, P, Q or A, T, C or any kind of CVC. CVC is consonant, vowel, consonant, a combination of consonant, vowel and consonant. And at different points of time, the subject was stopped and they were asked to recall the initial word that they had remembered. Von Peterson found that by the 18th second, the recall accuracy declined by 7 percent, only 7 percent recall accuracy was existing, which means that short term memory, if an information is not repeated, it will get lost. The idea here was that information which is presented to you would be repeated in your head, but that was not happening and because of that people lost this information. People were asked to hold on to a three letter CVC word, but the job of counting backwards was too taxing and this was interfering with remembering the CVC and because of that you were not getting time to rehearse the initial letters, three letter word which was given to you. So, at the end of let us say every minute people were asked to retrieve back. Since there were no repetition by the 18 second almost 7 percent accuracy of retention was found. Now, STM information declines with rehearsal for longer list or item difficulty. If a list is very long or if the items used in a short term memory are difficult, the chances are that they will get lost very easily. More syllable words reduce efficiency of STM. The more syllable a word has, the more difficult it becomes to speak it and because of that the efficiency of the STM would get reduced. Now, information capacity of the STM was tested by George Miller in an experiment and it was found to be 7 plus or minus 2 items. At the maximum you can have 7 items stored, at the minimum you have 5 items stored. So, this plus or minus 2 which is 7 plus 2 equal 9 and 7 minus 2 equal to 5 defines the limit of how much information can be stored in short term memory. Chunking is grouping words together. So, if I give you a number of lists and each list has some items. So, there is a list of vegetables, there is a list of uh, domestic animals, there is a list of objects, everyday objects and let us say there are 50 items and I ask you to remember all of them. What people would do is chunk them together. Items which are similar would be grouped together and this grouping together property is called chunking. The more I can chunk or the more I can reduce the group, the more information I can store. The capacity of short term memory depends on the complexity, similarity and coding strategy. The more complex an item is, the more space it will take, the more processing it will take and the capacity of STM will be lower. Two items which are similar will interfere with each other and how you code information, whether you use chunking or whether you use raw processing, phonological processing for storing information will define how much information can be stored in STM. Now, STM describe, is described as a single process for temporary storage, how then complex behavior is supported by working memory. Now, short term is a temporary storage for information where information is lost very quickly. How is it that people drive? In the example that we have discussed before where the child passes in front of you. Now, this information is in short term memory 
and if you do not repeat this information that the child is passing in front of you keep on mentally rehearsing, how then the long term memory knows what the query is, what kind of response should be selected because it has to know what is the situation which has come. Now, if 20 second is the time in which an information is lost and obviously when you are stressed then this time lowers down too much, how would it know what alternatives to select and for doing that another system was proposed which is called the working memory system. We will look into the working memory system in the next class. Very briefly in today's class we understood what is information processing. We also looked at what are the stages of information processing. We looked at what is multitasking and we also looked at two systems within the information processing architecture for humans. When we meet in the next class we will discuss additional structures which help in processing of information within the human cognitive system. So, till we meet again it is Namaskar from the MOOC studio. Thank you.